Hi teachers and pianists and friends. Today we're talking about how to teach the Bach invention number 14 in B flat major. It sounds like this. piece. I love teaching Bach in general, as you probably have figured out if you watched any of the videos on my channel here. And I do already have another video featuring the first invention in C major. So if you just click up there, you should be able to find that. I want to say I think the C major invention is the easiest. People oftentimes consider the C major number one and F major number eight to be, you know, a possible first invention experience. And I do believe those are the easiest. Then there's another group that this B flat major invention falls into of, you know, the next level of difficulty within the inventions. And I do like teaching this one as a second invention experience for reference on our Illinois AIM syllabus. This is level nine, and I do frequently use this as a level nine piece for my students. It's also on the RCM uh, syllabus level eight. So for both of those, that's really solidly in the upper intermediate almost to early advanced kind of level. So th this one is not hard for s several reasons. Number one, the opening is almost homophonic. That left hand part is very simple. It's just an outline of the tonic chord and then you get some other chords and that trades off with the right hand in measure six, you get the same thing, of course, just transposed to F major. So it's less intricate uh, polyphonic work between the hands. So it requires less independence of the hands than some of the other inventions and polyphonic works of Bach. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't ever become intricate. It certainly does. For anyone who's ever played this or taught this, you know that on the second page, things get a little bit more complicated. Um, this is also not terribly difficult because there are no ornaments. And it's also the same rhythmic pattern throughout. So if you're not really comfortable figuring out difficulty level of pieces, I would like to direct you to my repertoire difficulty worksheet, which I will certainly link in the description of this video. It just takes you through four categories of how to determine the difficulty level of one particular piece. And some of the things I already mentioned are in those categories, such as rhythm or stylistic things like ornaments or pitch content, all of that. So let's dive into this particular piece today. I'm looking at it in my old Henley Urtex, which I will of course link in the description, but I always pull out my Alfred Masterworks uh, Willard Palmer edition as well, because I find this to be such a helpful tool, particularly for students or recreational players. And um, I do, as a teacher, require my students to buy one of these when they get to the point where they're doing Bach inventions because I know they're probably gonna play more than one and it's you know one of those books that they can keep for the rest of their life and enjoy. So for this one, we have to be comfortable in B flat major, of course, which I actually think is one of the less comfortable keys on the piano because of where the black notes lie within the key, just the fact that B flat is one of only two flats and it's at the bottom of the tonic chord and the scale fingering is unique. And so your student should not be encountering B flat major for the first time when they play this piece. They should already know their B flat major scale and chord patterns and arpeggios very well at this point. They should be doing four note chord inversions, etc. So if you have any questions about technical warmups like that, feel free to leave a comment below and I'm happy to kind of talk through those things, but just to say they should already know that by the point that they're playing this invention. The rhythmic content of this piece is interesting in that yes, it's the same pattern over and over and over again. So once you've got it, it's not complicated at all, but we do have 30 second notes, which we frankly don't encounter, you know, that frequently in the intermediate repertoire for sure. And so I don't see any problem with introducing this rhythmic pattern by ear or by rote as a preparation for this piece that maybe you do a little tapping with rhythm sticks or syllabification or whatever you like to do so that a student is feeling one, two, that kind of thing. One, two, and the two. Um, and then 
even just talking about the subject, that original theme, before you do too much work on this, and ironing out exactly what the rhythm is. Uh, one, and two, three. And I think it's perfectly fine while you're figuring that out to think in the eighth note, so thinking in eight, eight, as opposed to four, four. Of course, we do not want our students ultimately feeling this in that pulse, but I'm just talking about understanding exactly what's going on rhythmically, that they can think one and two, sorry, one E and a two, E and a three, E and So that then later they can feel one, two, three, which of course does lead to a discussion about tempo in this piece. You really can't play this at a really fast 4-4 four, four tempo because you just don't have time to literally play all the 30 second notes. So it kind of gives it the affect that I think Bach was looking for in this piece of this gentle, warm, pleasant kind of feel. And it's not rushing, it's not intense like maybe the a minor invention right before this, number 13, would be very different feel, even though the meter is in fact the same. Okay, so let's talk about the subject or the main theme. We basically have two beats ascending, outlining a in the, in the beginning, a B flat major chord, a tonic chord, and then it comes down and Bach throws one little transitional accidental at the end of measure one, it happens to be an A flat, which then takes you to the next chord that you outline going up and then coming down. And most of the time, it's two sets of this worth, um, but it gets interrupted later. So we have going up B flat major, coming down, then E flat major, coming down, and then an F7 coming down, and then it finishes for those first three measures. in this key. Those should be chords that your student at this level is very comfortable with and analyzing, just understanding I'm playing one, four, and five, seven should not be a big challenge here. I think it will really help them if they just have that basic idea that that's the progression that Bach is using. And of course, we all know that the true genius of Bach is that he writes these intricate contrapuntal lines, in this case two lines throughout this piece, that then also align homophonically to make this beautiful chord progression. So that's, you know, the genius and something we want to draw our students' attention to. All right, so then we get at the end, one of the best parts of this piece is that Bach actually interrupts that subject in the last iteration in the right hand. It starts as kind of a pickup to 17. Just like the beginning. Ah, oh, a little change, still E flat. interrupted then by this octave syncopated jump and then a seventh even more interesting now while that's going the left hand has already started a beat earlier the full iteration of this so in the middle of bar 16 part of the whole piece starting right there in the middle of bar 16 because nowhere else do we have the subject overlaid just displaced by a beat in this piece that feels more like a fugue might feel um, with a you know subject and counter subject it's literally just the exact same thing just displaced by a beat and then we get the change in the right hand with that interruption so the Easiest way to practice this is simply to do backwards practice where your student plays the last two beats, then the last three beats, and then so on, the last four, last five, etc. You can also do that by half measures, it doesn't have to be by single beat, 
or eventually by whole measures once they have that coordination worked out. And it should go without saying that when they're first doing that hands together, it should be very slow. <laughs> you know, they, they need time to think about how these things line up. Now, talking about lining up, right above that, we get this lovely parallel motion in bar 15, 16. I'm sorry, it's 14, 15, 16. My bar numbers are displaced in my Henley here. So starting in 14, very easy because the hands are doing the same rhythmic pattern they're moving in the same direction but what I found to be difficult in that part when I teach it is that the black white relationship of the keys is never the same in the two hands and so just getting your fingers on a black note or a white note correctly can be actually quite problematic so one thing that you can verbalize when practicing this is actually the white black what color key you're playing so you could say I'm starting in 14 again black white white black white 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 black white 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 black and and then just take a second and look at that in the first one the black notes on the bottom in the second iteration the black notes on the top now let's compare that with the left hand in the left hand the black note is on top first and then in the second one it's in the middle so just seeing that notes are placed very differently and then deciding on your fingering on how you want to start each of those little three note patterns based on if you're starting on a black note if you're gonna have a black note on the bottom etc so just know even though that looks easy there's no accidentals or there's just one it's it is actually difficult to coordinate and also to memorize because you're dealing with all that different topographical issues all right, as far as articulation goes, I know I always talk about articulation when I'm speaking about Baroque pieces because I think it is the primary expressive device that we have when playing Baroque music. There actually aren't that many choices to be made in this piece because it's so monothematic. It just uses that. I checked Palmer's suggested articulation. He just suggests one slur over the entire half measure and then a lift before you start the 32nd note. So slur from here lift and then slur again lift and slur again and I think that's a great starting point uh, with then the left hand or any eighth notes that you get being detached one note while I'm playing that B flat I fully believe that those quarter notes should be full value and release exactly on the rest remember on the organ or harpsichord you will hear the release on the organ you'll hear it because the wind stops on the harpsichord you hear it because there's actually a little tiny noise when the quill releases so i'm really persnickety with my students that they need to hold that full value and rest right when the right hand plays on beat four back to articulation in the theme i think one other real good option is that you could do two note slurs on the 16th on beats two and four like this recordings online so that's one other way to make it a little bit more interesting that requires a little more coordination in your hand so you would want to make sure your student was really capable of doing that while doing other intricacies if that's the articulation that they choose to play expressively I do think you would have to make a really strong case for why you should play these legato I don't hear it that way at all um, because I think like a baroque cellist that they would detach those um, but that, you know, it's all a matter of choice and opinion and how you want to express. I hope that gives you a few ideas on how to teach the Bach invention in B flat major. Please subscribe to my channel, share this video with a friend if you found it helpful, and I wish you all the best in your teaching and playing.